Here I've listed a rearrangement of the numbers between 1 and 9. Notice some of these numbers are larger than all the numbers next to them. For example, this number is larger than any number next to it, and this number is larger than any number next to it. 9 automatically is, and then the 8 is as well. So here we have four numbers that are larger than all the numbers next to it. We call these numbers peaks. So a question is, if we look at all possible rearrangements of the numbers 1 through 9, what's the average number of peaks in all the numbers among them? Here, for example, we have four peaks. In some rearrangements, we have, might have fewer peaks and some more peaks. In this video, we're going to see how to calculate the average number of peaks in an interesting way. And the reason for doing this is it's going to illuminate a counting technique that's used quite a bit in combinatorics and not something that is very standard but is really really useful in many different settings. So stay tuned to find out how to determine the number of peaks and look at this interesting counting perspective. Hey welcome to today's video I'm Prof Omar. This channel is dedicated to undergraduate theorems and problems for your road through the undergraduate and to prepare you for the road beyond. If this is your first time on the channel, definitely subscribe to the channel if this resonates with you and click the bell for notifications on future videos. And if you're already a subscriber on the channel, welcome back. So today we're going to talk about this interesting problem of counting the number of peaks or positions where a number is greater than the numbers next to it in all rearrangements of the numbers 1 through 9. And the question we're going to ask is, how, what's the average number of peaks among all of these rearrangements? Now, if we start listing rearrangements, maybe I'll list two more. Okay, I decided to actually list four more. One thing we could do is go along and record the number of peaks in each of these. Okay, so I went ahead and did this in these permutations. And so one strategy you might think is to go along and make some observations by looking at different types of rearrangements of the numbers 1 through 9. For example, you might think, okay, well, if there's a number here that I can make an analysis based on what's next and then follow through and maybe analyze that way. So the strategy I want to use for counting this is one strategy that's often used in combinatorics. And it's a strategy that I think is very useful in a lot of different areas of math. For example, when I typically teach abstract algebra, there's a really nice proof of one of the theorems in there called the orbit stabilizer theorem that actually uses a similar strategy to what we're about to employ right now. So this is a strategy that's not only useful for counting, but actually useful in many different areas of mathematics. And the idea is to think about this not as a list of a sequence of numbers, but actually as an array of numbers that's two-dimensional. Right, so instead of looking at things row by row, it may be useful to actually look at the numbers column by column and ask how many peaks are there when you list all of these rearrangements in every single column. And it turns out in this particular case, this is an adv advantageous perspective. So let's take a look, and I want to motivate this by looking at these two particular permutations right over here. Okay. So if you notice this, these two look very similar except for their first two positions, right? If I take these two numbers and swap them, then in exactly one of these permutations or rearrangements of the number, numbers between 1 and 9, one of these is going to have a peak and one is not. So you can imagine then, because all the numbers to the right of these are the same, you can imagine then listing these numbers in a way where you pair numbers that have a match like this, where you start off with a number x, y, and then the same suffix for the next seven elements of your rearrangement, and then somewhere else in the list is y, x, together with that same suffix. And among those two, because only exactly one of x is greater than y or vice versa, like here one is greater than three, only exactly one of these is going to be, is going to have a peak in this first position, and one of them is not. So if we look at it from that perspective, pairing 
numbers or pairing rearrangements that look alike in this way, then the number of peaks we're going to see in this first column is exactly one half of the number of arrangements. This, the no total number of rearrangements is 9 factorial, and in exactly half of them we're going to see a peak in this first position by this argument. Similarly, in this last position we're going to see exactly half times 9 factorial as well. So I'm going to keep those in mind that the number of peaks in the first position is a half times 9 factorial and the last is also a half times 9 factorial. Let's look at what happens in the intermediate steps by looking at a particular example. Okay, let's say we're interested in determining the number of peaks that happen in one of these middle columns right over here. What I've done is then looked at the three numbers that are central to that column, meaning the three numbers that are in that column itself to the left and to the right, because those things affect whether or not this particular entry in this column is a peak. And I've made all of the other positions be exactly the same. So this is the way to think about grouping the sequences, all nine factorial of them, to assess how many peaks there are in a given middle column. So we see here that the number of times a particular, this particular column is a peak is exactly two. It happens when you pick the largest of these three numbers to be in the center. Right, so the chance of being a peak then in one of these middle columns is exactly one third of the time. So we'll have one third times nine factorial peaks in any one of these middle columns. Okay, so in the middle column, we get uh, one third in any of the middle columns, we get one third times nine factorial many peaks. So if you collect all the peaks column by column then, we see that we have in two of the columns this many peaks and in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven of the columns this many peaks. The total number of rearrangements we had was 9 factorial. So dividing this common factor of 9 factorial, we get an average of 2 times a half plus 7 times a third, an average of 10 thirds many peaks in any given rearrangement. This idea is really kind of an interesting idea, looking at things column by column instead of row by row. One of the things that we used here that's taught in a course on probability in the undergraduate is what's called linearity of expectation, which means that these positions, we can figure out the expected number of peaks in total by figuring out what the chance any one of these elements as a peak is, and then adding that all together. So I definitely suggest taking an undergraduate probability course if you have the option of doing so, because this is an example of just a myriad of places in which linearity of expectation really comes up. Furthermore, this type of technique of looking at columns versus rows is a very, very common technique used in a lot of areas of discrete mathematics and algebra. So I hope you liked today's video. If you did, click the like button. If you'd like to see more videos like this, definitely subscribe to the channel and click the bell for notification on future videos.